Good morning and welcome to Grace Bible Church Online. Uh, this is Labor Day weekend in the United States and as I think of it, labor was not a curse from the fall into sin, but God gave Adam and Eve responsibilities in the garden to uh, take care of the fruit, take care of the garden, and to enjoy uh, the garden. But uh, obviously, since the fall, we are laboring much more vigorously now because of the, the fall into sin. But we're here today to worship the Lord and to enjoy singing together and the fellowship with one another. Thanks for joining us online though. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the creator and we thank you for the changing of the seasons and we're grateful for uh, the work that you've given us to do. We pray that you'd help us to be honorable and responsible and creative in the things that you've given to us. Lord, may we honor you in both word and deed and as we worship you today with our music, with, our, with the word of God, uh, we pray that our hearts might be uh, attentive and that we would be responsive to be doing what you asked us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, church. Today I'd like to take a slightly different approach in our persecuted church segment. Instead of a notable country on the world watch list, I'd like to share some personal insight from friends of mine on what persecution looks like in Kurdistan instead. Kurdistan is not a country, but rather a mountainous, autonomous region consisting of northern Iraq, western Iran, and southeast Turkey, while also covering smaller regions of northeastern Syria and southern Armenia. Between 25 and 35 million Kurds inhabit the region that straddles these borders. They make up the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, but have never obtained a permanent country to settle in. The Kurds are widely recognized to be the largest stateless group in the world. Islam, of course, is the predominant religion in Kurdistan, and the Christian population has suffered severely at the hands of Islamic extremists. We are routinely reminded of their persecution methods during these segments, violence, abduction, murder, and more. But factors outside those of the majority religion also play a factor in persecution. Things such as government, non-government power players, status, perception, and even methods of witnessing in some cases. In most areas of Kurdistan, the government doesn't really care that people come to faith at Christ. Small numbers and no political interest mean little threat to governmental stability where dangerous extremist groups operate. Instead, the biggest hindrance is the perceived insult to both extended family and work networks who view a decision for Christ as a personal rejection of the most sacred aspect of their family and cultural identity. Family and cultural identity carry far more weight in Kurdistan than in the West. People are far less individuals and more a piece of a wider context. For example, people rarely take better paying jobs in another city or country because it is seen as turning your back on your family. The family is obligated then to correct deviant behavior in a somewhat public manner. It proves to other families that yours is respectable, responsible, and reliable. Your family's ability to secure necessities such as education, employment, and housing stem primarily from reputation. Exchanging your family identity for Christ's family and trusting others to not call you out for it are the biggest barriers to the church widely taking root. For most, the fear of persecution is worse than actual persecution. Still, it is not easy. My friend personally knows people who have suffered at the hands of relatives, having had arms broken, houses ransacked, public threats of murder, house arrest, spouses abandoned, kidnapped, or forced to flee. This is also why most new believers are male, because a female without family cover has zero chance of success or survival. Many people in the region have said they would become believers if it weren't for their families. It is difficult for people in Kurdistan to understand the cost of following Christ. There is no biblical example of an anonymous Christian. Every believer has a mission and everyone who wants to live a godly life will be persecuted. Those who try to hide their faith never grow. There are a handful of churches in Kurdistan that have local leaders. Dozens of small Bible studies and discipleship groups exist as there are many Muslims who are curious to know the gospel. Sadly, fear of persecution thins out the harvest so that only the spiritually hungry outlast the spiritually curious. However, the efforts of these churches have not been entirely fruitless. 
My friend related to me one specific personal experience he had in Kurdistan back in 2016. He was doing a Bible study with a young man who was growing in a spiritual conviction that Christ is the resurrected and living God. Some of the young man's co-workers heard and began to rough him up one day after work. Beaten and bloody, he called my friend and exclaimed, I absolutely believe now. My friend asked, when did that happen? The young man's reply was, just before the big guy hit me over the head with a stick. He had experienced the precious presence of Christ during the beating. Lord, let's pray. Lord, we pray for Kurdistan that you would supply seekers to experience the power of Christ so that they are confident he is alive and present no matter what the cost. We pray for new believers to church together instead of individually out of fear. We pray for churches to grow and expand there so Christianity is more commonplace, making it less odd to become a believer. We pray for strong, biblically committed leaders and elders. And finally, we pray for regional instability to remain only if it glorifies you, Lord, and leads to further growth in your church. Amen.
my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith. Oh, praise the God of every grace. Now to the God of every grace, who counts my tears, who holds my days. I sing through sorrow, sing with faith. Oh, praise the God of every grace. Oh, praise the God of every grace. I know this sounds like a very odd question as we start off uh, this morning, but what is your favorite donut? Again, I, I know it's a very odd question. I'll explain though. Uh, mine happens to be a maple frosted long john with Bavarian cream or custard filling. Uh, now, I, I first, <laughs> why I don't know, but that kind of has tempted my senses and still does yet today. And I, I first took a liking to them uh, when I was around my oldest son's age. Uh, my dad and I were actually helping a neighbor uh, shell ear corn out of a corn crib that he had rented and, and that was really not an uncommon um, happening when I was a kid. Uh, we often, as local farmers, there was four or five of us that uh, regularly in the spring that we would help each other empty the corn cribs out. Sometimes we would uh, help each other with baling hay during the summer or uh, combining fields. We just kind of exchange services, if you will, back and forth. And um, we, th again, there was no money often, at least to my recollection, no money exchanged. It was just simply neighbors being neighbors, helping each other out and serving each other. But there was often those snacks, um, sometimes a full meal, but I remember uh, that one farmer in particular always got Casey's Donuts and that was um, what I, where I took a liking to them. And as each time I have them, even yet today, it brings back to mind the importance of those relationships, uh, really the importance of community as well. In the book, Spiritual Formation Is, the authors write of this bit of history they'd like to share with you this morning. In the 1700s, Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf was born into wealth and nobility. In his early 20s, Nicholas was approached by a persecuted group of Christians from, uh, of, of Moravian, excuse me, group of Moravians uh, requesting refuge on his estate. Zinzendorf granted their request and seeing their authentic and deep devotion ended up joining them in what became an amazing Christian community. A few years later, he left public life to help lead them full time. And under his leadership, the large group of several hundred was divided into smaller groups of fellowship and held to a tight code of Christian behavior. And soon they remarked there was a remarkable religious refugee community and they experienced a powerful outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The result was a continuous prayer meeting covering nearly, covering, excuse me, every hour of every day for a hundred years. And that emphasis on prayer launched a radical commitment to costly missions. And I, I found this very interesting that upon arriving at the shores of their destinations, the Moravian missionaries would unload their few belongings and then burn their ships. They planned to die on the field sharing the gospel. What they started, uh, what they stated, uh, what the, excuse me, what they started has been called the birth of the modern missionary movement. There we go, get my reading right here. For Zinzendorf, though, everything flowed out of the unity of community. The people he pastored forged a powerful structure of intentional relationships, doing life together, corporate prayer, and global evangelism that impacts us yet today. He saw the pure heart of Christianity when he said this, there can be no Christianity without community. And I want you to hear that again, that, hear that phrase once more because I think it's very important we understand it. There can be no Christianity without community. And that phrase is really somewhat of a teaser for this fall as we head back into the book of Romans. Uh, in Romans 1 through 11, Paul told us how we chose the pleasures of sin that was coated in self-pride or the excellencies of God himself. We were originally created for fellowship or community with God, but we saw, as we saw in Genesis 3, 
over really the last couple of weeks, the fall broke that fellowship. And sin has caused a relational barrier for the unsaved between them and God. And even as saved people, sin causes relational distance even yet between us and God. And so Romans 1 through 11, in one respect, is Paul explaining how God made fellowship with him, community with him, possible again through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which we're going to remember this morning as we observe communion together. He desired for us to get the full picture of what, the full picture that we might praise God for what he had done and is yet doing even yet to restore that fellowship. And as we get into Romans 12 to 16 this fall, Pastor Paul's going to be here on that next week, uh, we're going to see how really the gospel applies not only to our relationship with God, but to our relationships with one another, to the church community. And so you might say from one perspective then that the whole of Romans hints on the concept of community, which brings us back to that phrase we talked about earlier, there could be no Christianity without community. In a, in a society and Christian culture that is saturated and infected by individualism, one of the additional topics I wanted to cover before the close of summer was that of community. We know the word, we've used it many times, but I'd really like us to take a deeper dive into it from a biblical perspective this morning. What does God have to say about community? And as we get into the scriptures, we ask ourselves as well, how do I need to even to adjust my view of community as I'm encountering these things? And with an openness to God's leading, what will my response be to this? As we begin this morning, though, I'd like us to return back to a familiar passage you might be questioning if we're ever going to get out of it, we will. But turn back to Genesis chapter 1 again this morning. Because there's one more important element to glean from that on this subject in particular of community. Looking at verse 26, so we read this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the cattle and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move on the earth. Flipping forward to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, and we read this, And the Lord God said, Now that man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, he must not be allowed to stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, the first element I'd like to direct your attention to this morning is this, is community modeled in the Godhead. We've been speaking, I know, a lot or spending a lot of time in Genesis over the last few weeks, and I, I believe it was actually Ken Ham who remarked that the first several chapters of Genesis really are crucial to our understanding of much of the rest of Scripture. If we interpret these incorrectly or disregard them, we miss so much and we become skewed as we look at the rest of Scripture. And the same is true as we talk about community this morning. And a couple of weeks ago, I, we concentrated our focus on the plurals, specifically of chapter 1, verse 26. We didn't spend much time, though, on those related to God, other than to note that it points to his plurality. I'd like us to consider it again, though, this morning. Note that God uses there, verse 26, the words us and our. And then in chapter 3, verse 22, he uses the word us Again, these all point, once more, to the plurality of God, which is a major building block of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, now, what is the Trinity? B.B. Warfield gave this explanation of it, which is a bit of a theological one, but uh, will serve you well. There is one only and true God, but in the unity of the Godhead, there are three co-equal and co-eternal persons. In other words, they all share those, those attributes. The same in substance... In other words, in their character and who they are, uh, but distinct in subsistence, that is, in their roles. And, and to be honest, this concept of Trinity and the, and the plurality and the unity melded together is quite perplexing for us. And I understand that. I, 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 I can't get my mind fully wrapped around that. I don't think any of us can, but that's what Scripture tells us. These verses, though, remind us, though, that there is relationship within the Godhead. There is community. The Father, Son, and Spirit, as God's singular, are not just community, but also communally do things together. All, look at several chapters, Old Testament and New Testament, all are involved in creation. 
all are involved in salvation, all are involved in the resurrection. And so from the doctrine of the Trinity, we see this crucial application that the Father, Son, and Spirit have existed eternally in relationship with one another as one God in three persons. Now, as a, as a bit of a side note, uh, this, this always astounds me. Um, I, I know how close and intimate my relationship gets with someone as I spend time with them. Uh, my wife and I, our relationship has deepened uh, from uh, the day that we were originally married. We know each other better. We understand each other better. <laughs> and I certainly hope so. That's characteristic of all marriages. But uh, since the, from the day we got married till now, you know, 14 years later. Um, in fact, to the point now that we can almost we can look at each other and we know what each other is thinking uh, about a particular situation or what words we're thinking about. Uh, Pastor Paul and I, we've been working side by side for 15 years and, and we often remark that, that when, when something comes up, we have the same exact uh, remarks about it or we, can, we know what each other's thinking, we can almost finish each other's sentences. So there's, there's an intimacy of relationship there. Now, can you imagine for a moment the depth of relationship that exists in the Godhead? God has existed eternally. And it just explodes my mind a bit to think of that. And, and, and it should give us then something to strive for. God is a relational being who created us as relational beings so that we could be, uh, could image him. And in a culture focused so much on individualism, it's, in, it's, it's paramount that we return to our biblical roots. We were meant for relationship. Now, I understand some can certainly handle more and more, many more relationships than others can, but nevertheless, we were created for community. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 tells us the two shall become one flesh. That's a, that's a community, isn't it? Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17, one of my favorite verses as we talk about discipleship of iron sharpening iron, that is a concept based upon community, on relationship, about people living together and mutually benefiting one another to grow, right? Are we seeking those relationships? Are we being intentional about deepening those relationships with one another rather than just hoping that they'll happen? We see in these foundational passages that we are created in the image of God and part of that means that we're created for community. And in, a mental, in this individualistic mentality that's continuing to affect uh, our society and our church culture, especially in, in Western society, uh, we must not seek to live the Christian life as lone rangers, but instead model God himself uh, and the relationships that he shows us there. Now, we see community in the God as we further explore this with Jesus coming to earth. We see second thing I want to highlight for you this morning, community valued and practiced by Jesus. Now turn to Mark chapter 3. In that chapter, Jesus is selecting his disciples. Uh, his apostles. And starting in verse 13, we read this. Now Jesus went up to the mount and called for those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, whom he named apostles, so that they could be, would be with him, and he would send them to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. He appointed 12. To Simon, he gave the name Peter. To James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, he gave the name uh, Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. We see him selecting the twelve there. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 commanded believers to follow him, to be imitators of him as he followed or imitated Christ. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2 tells us that the mark of being a disciple of Christ, of possessing salvation even, is that we walk as Jesus walked. The question then that we need to ask is what does it mean to imitate Jesus or walk as he walked? And one element of the answer to that question is the word community. Here in Mark chapter 3, he, we see him choosing the 12, and he would spend nearly three years then, around three years, working side by side with those men. 
They ate together, they traveled together, they spent countless hours, while we, we don't have it all recorded, I, they spent countless hours in conversation with each other. Uh, he was teaching them. They learned from his example as they watched him minister to both Jew and even Gentile by meeting both physical and spiritual needs. And if you take a moment to look through the Gospels and, and, and the life of Jesus and soak that all in, you'll find that he spent significant time with multitudes and with the 12 and even with three, as in the account of the Transfiguration in Matthew 17. In fact, as you look through the Gospels, it is rare that you ever find Jesus alone. Uh, in fact, I looked it up this week. There are a few times in the Gospels that mentions he went off by himself. But do you know what's unique about those times? Most of the times when he went off by himself, he went off to pray. And so he simply went off to seek different fellowship for a moment. He, he was still having community, but with his father. And so he was rarely ever truly alone. Some time ago, I, now I, I read a meme, which is, uh, those of you who, if you don't know what that is, uh, it's a rapidly spreading image or video that's often humorous. You see them a lot of times on social media. Uh, you can send them via an email, but social media is where you find them all the time. Uh, and the meme was related to COVID-19 and, and, and dis social distancing that was going on at the time. And I, I don't recall the exact wording, but it said something like this. The title across the top was social distancing and the response of introverts was something like, we've been preparing for this our whole lives. You know, the, the, the distancing and the being alone and by ourselves. And you can still find various uh, related memes online about it today. And, I, you know, I had a good laugh at them as I uh, encountered them because, because I relate. Um, I'm naturally a bit of an in, introvert, which I wonder, um, a bit of a psychology point, I guess, thinking back at that stemmed from my uh, being bullied as a child, you know, just staying away from everybody then. Um, I personally, I like to be alone in my shop. I like to be out on the water alone or on a tractor alone. I, I, I loved, <laughs> um, my wife thinks this is absolutely ridiculous, but I loved mowing roadsides when I worked for a farmer uh, for a few summers. I, I conversed with him for just a few minutes in the morning to get the plan for the day, and then I'd spend the next top 10 hours by myself from the tractor going up and down the road. Um, I love that though. And, um, I, I love our church family here, but there's, but relational, and I don't mean this negatively, but relational interaction tires me. Um, and I personally, I consider that to be part of the fall. And I don't mean, again, I don't mean this negatively toward uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I have to work at conversation and at relational interaction. Those things don't come as easily for me as they do for my wife. She thrives on that. Um, again, I think that's part of the fall. And I, I relate back to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, understanding it is a weakness on my part, and that's an area I need to depend upon the grace of God to strengthen me in and to overcome that all the, all the more. And I know there are others who are introverts that would relate. And, and I say that because that is not an excuse for not fulfilling the example of Christ. Well, I'm an introvert. That's not my thing. No, that, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Christ lived what? In community. Now, having times alone is not bad. And I know there's, there is a um, mentality even now among dads that you go home to your man cave and have time alone. There may be a time for that, but you're meant to what? Live in community with your family to have an impact on them. And when we make a habit of those things, of that aloneness and, and secluding ourselves from those around us, we're ceasing really to follow in the footsteps of Christ. An author writes, involvement in community with others was a primary spiritual discipline in the life of Jesus Christ. Just as it was then, following Jesus today means following him into relationships with other Christ followers. And so the question we must ask is if Jesus, the Son of God, felt the need to be involved in community, how much more should you and I be involved in it as well? Now, continue to mull over that. Uh, the high value, again, the high value of it in the Godhead that Jesus himself placed on it during his time here on earth on relationships. And, and as we move into this next element on the subject of community, continue to think about those things. Third thing this morning, we find community as the foundation 
the foundation of the early church. Um, as you open up the book of Acts, the, the church be, and the church begins, you see these words almost immediately. Acts chapter 2, look there. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 40 to 46. Note what, the, note what Luke writes. It says, They were devoting themselves, verse 42, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone, and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. All who believed were together and held everything in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts. They were breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Now, it's actually through verse 47, but uh, in your Bibles, and if you have those in front of you, or if you have it up on your, front, on your phone, again, scroll back through that segment of text. Note for a moment, and if you need to underline it, do it. How many plurals are used in that segment of verses? Note how many words are related to fellowship and community activities. Community was the foundation of the early church. They were daily devoted to teaching, which involved gathering together. They daily, they gathered in the temple and in houses for conversation and meals. They were attending to each other's needs. And that, that in and of itself is a community or relational activity because you have to know the other person, don't you? You have to know the individuals to, and know the needs to even begin to meet them. This early Christian community was known for their devotion to one another. In my studies this past spring, I was um, reading a book on the early church culture. Uh, historically, at the time, houses were uh, very close together. In fact, a collection of houses was often, I found, structured around a common courtyard. Uh, the rooms of the home were... Uh, unlike ours today, many times today we have specific rooms in our house meant for specific purposes. You know, you have your living room where you hang out to rest and relax. You have your dining room where you eat. Um, they may have ate on the roofs of their houses or they spent time up there. Uh, much of the room in their house was mainly meant for sleeping. And so there wasn't so a whole lot of hanging out going on in their houses. They were on the roofs of the houses in the evening or they were in the common courtyards at that bundle of houses shared together. And so as families came to faith in Christ, they were likely living next door to one another, or they shared a common courtyard together. And so quite literally, they were doing life together on a daily basis because they were constantly around one another. Uh, now, I understand in our modern context that distance um, precludes some of those habits, again, in our present day, but I want us to understand that community was truly a foundation of the early church. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2 again. I know we were there last week, but let's turn there to again this week, looking at the verses immediately preceding what we looked at last week. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. You were shown no mercy, but now you have received mercy. Note again, look there, Bibles are on your phones, whatever you got up right now. Note again the aspects of identity that Paul mentioned, or excuse me, Peter mentions in verse 9. They are what? We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people of his own. Peter tells us that we are identified with Christ whom uh, we have been set apart for to follow, who is our mediator and whose ultimately we are. And as I, as I read other authors, the, the Lord often uses them to teach me and to gain new insights. And I hadn't thought about this before in reading this particular passage, but those same words in verse 9, note again, they are in plural in nature. These are corporate identities, a race, a priesthood, a nation, a people. And the author remarked, as the church, we need to recapture our sense of community and connectedness with one another. 
Peter reminds us that we are indeed a people, not a collection of individuals. And thus Peter calls us to this perspective that we are a people whose identity is in Christ and that we are to have a corporate or communal understanding of that identity. This means that we are committed to one another and and to our collective growth in Christ. We're not concerned just about ourselves, we're concerned about one another because we're part of that community. Community, again, we see here is it was the foundation was the identity of the early church beyond, of course, ultimately Christ. Uh, and as I ask the next few questions, I want you to think about them and to answer them honestly for yourself for just a moment. Uh, answer these three questions to yourself. First of all, what is your motivation for coming if, if you're here locally um, or if you gather with another group of believers? What is your motivation for participating in those corporate gatherings? Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're going there, do you go on a Sunday morning? Do you follow us online out of religious duty or obligation? Are Sunday mornings, third question, merely a religious event to attend? Or do you see them as something more? Think about those things for a moment. Now, what I'm about to say next is not meant to be seen as or interpreted as a parent or teacher scolding a child or a student. I, I want to make you aware of something, of our situation here, um, which is common, I believe, in other churches as well. I don't believe that we're unique in this respect. Uh, we have personally here at Grace, there's about 50 or so regular online viewers based upon um, YouTube analytics and math and that kind of stuff that they use. That's our online stats. Uh, We have about 115 people that call GBC home or are a part of our physical body here locally. Uh, Now, I know that illness, mobility, work, schedules, even they sometimes prevent people from gathering. Uh, Oftentimes those things cross each other and it frustrates me at times, but that's just being a pastor. Uh, But I want you to know that each week here at Grace, and I would bet that this is true of other churches as well, that we are missing between 30 and 60% of our number. That's about 30 to 70 people that are gone each week from our church family and our local gathering here. Now, this is not an attendance issue uh, or attendance thing. I'm not so much concerned about attendance. Um, I I used to be so camped out on that, but um, I've chosen to surrender that to the Lord, and I have to continue to do that. Lord, they're, they're in your hands. You're the one leading them. Um, my concern is this. Um, in comparison to the workforce of our present day, as a national average, it only has 3.2% absent on a daily basis. So if you consider Sundays as kind of the main gathering of the church, we have a trend of, of um, uh, you know, 30, 60%, at least here, being gone. Workforce, 3.2. That's, that's a great imbalance, I think. My concern as I've watched numbers here through the years here at Grace is that there may be a trend beyond, again, just our local body. Are we now seeing Sunday as merely an event that we participate in rather than the wondrous opportunity of the body of Christ gathered for mutual celebration and service? Are we elevating things in priority above community of the church? Again, this is just a suspicion of mine based upon numbers. Ultimately, your answers to the questions I asked earlier would confirm or negate that suspicion. Is, though, the idea of community and close-knit relationships that was a foundation of the church and meant to be yet today fading away from the present church's DNA? Are we buying more into the individualism of Western society and considering more of that as the rule and follow my own needs and my own desires rather than considering the greater good of the community? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 uses the human body knit together in all its parts and each part meant to support the other uh, as an example of how the church looks and functions. And per Paul's own words, none of us can say that we don't need the other one. Yet when we choose not to gather, whether we're talking about Sundays or the middle of the week, or if we routinely allow things to take over those, the other times, whatever they might be, our choice essentially says, I don't need the rest of the body. 
And I would be willing to bet that there's some spiritual indifference in our lives as well in those cases. One author writes, we are created to draw life from one another the way the roots of an oak tree draw life from the soul, from the soil, excuse me. <laughs> A very different word. When we are missing members of the body for weeks or even months at a time, or we choose not to serve the body, our local family misses critical pieces for its overall function and its health. And I, every pastor would agree on that. I'm not the only one that would say that. From Genesis, from the Old Testament, the New Testament, we see Godhead, or we see community. We see it modeled in the Godhead. We see it practiced and valued by Jesus. We see it as a foundation of the church. It's meant yet for today. And I would be remiss, though, if we didn't briefly hit on this last element this morning. If it is so important, what does it look like to live in community. And so let's look at that now. What does it look like to live in community? There's several words in the New Testament that are connected with the concept of the church. Uh, the word ecclesia, which we often translate as church, refers to the called out assembly or gathering. Uh, community then implies once more that the church is more than what? One. There's a fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ, an assembly, a gathering. The concept of communion as a relational word, and I'm not talking about the ordinance of the church, I'm talking about communion uh, as a relational word, is written about in the New Testament using two adjectives, three nouns, and two verbs in the Greek. All of these words employ within them a segment called koin, as in the word koinonia, or fellowship. Uh, a scholar writes this, the important thing is that these words belonging to the coin family refer primarily to participation in something rather than association with others. Now, I want you to catch that. He presents a contrast here. The coin family and things related to communion refer to participation versus association. And thus we're called by the very nuances of the language itself associated with church life to be participants and not merely spectators, not merely associated with the church. And applying this to the local church, it means that we are involved in meaningful ways that contribute to the spiritual health and maturity of the collective body. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. And that we're not merely on the roster. We're in the game. We're just on the roster. With that idea of our concept of community, one author writes, it moves us beyond then the self-interested isolation of private lives and beyond the superficial social contacts that pass for Christian fellowship. The biblical idea of community challenges us instead to commit our ourselves to life together as the people of God. Now, what does that look like? Practically speaking, Nearly 60 times in the New Testament, we are given specific commands of what that means. And those commands are called the one another's. And here's just a few of them for you this morning of the nearly 60 that are mentioned in Scripture. We're called to love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, pray for one another, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, speak truth to one another, bear one, another bur one another's burdens, be patient with and tolerate one another, be humble toward one another. Those are just a few. And those aren't given to just select people or people with the right personality, the right gifts. Those are commands are given to all the church. Everyone, every believer, they're given to. Now, as you read those, though, or as you hear those, you may ask what those concepts look like in our own day and age. And I want to encourage you with this. If you have not made this a regular habit, start with inviting people over and getting to know their story. How did they come to faith in Christ? What's going on with them presently? Um, find out how you can pray for them. Ask them, are there any ways that you can serve them practically right now? As you get to know the person, you will understand how to practice the one another's toward them. And I say that because of this. We, we all are a little bit unique. Generally, there's things, ways in which we can love on each other, in which we can pray for each other. I understand that. But as those relationships deepen and as we understand one another more, we, we understand very, very clearly how to apply these things to each individual in our local fellowship. Now, I understand we're not going to have the same depth of relationship with everyone, and that, that's okay. I understand that. Uh, but we must be relationally connected in some way so that we're not marbles in a bag that scatter once persecution and hard times come. 
Jesus challenges us that our love as well for one another should be so evident practically that it becomes a testimony to our world. John chapter 13, verses 35, 34 to 35, he says to his disciples, I give you a new commandment to love one another just as, that's a quality word, he's telling us how to do it, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Everyone will know by this, a favorite phrase of John, by this, that's always an indicator, pay attention, something's coming, you need, to, you need to listen up, you need to highlight this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And for it ultimately to be evident, it also means that it needs to be shown outside the walls here, right? Uh, not for the sake of the people seeing how great we are, but that so they might see how the grace of God and the hope of Christ has changed us, resulting, hopefully, in people looking to and glorifying God. You want to know what living in community looks like even more? I encourage you to be part of our Sunday School Hour this fall. Um, we're going to be fleshing that out very, very practically, uh, what it means for believers to live in relation to one another and to our world. Now, by way of summation this morning, and looking at these passages, the Godhead has modeled community for us for eternity, really. Jesus, as he came to earth, showed us the value of community as he himself practiced it with the Twelve. The church was built on and saw community as foundational to their identity as they began, and the communal concept was continually encouraged throughout the New Testament writings. By way of numerous commands, we are called to community yet today, to purposeful fellowship within the church, to intimate relationships with one another where we know needs and hurts and joys that we might serve and rejoice with one another. As we talked earlier this morning, the very nuances of the word related to community call us to be active participants for the mutual benefit of one another. The question, though, that we're left with, and what we started with this morning, is this. Do you have community? You know, here at Grace, that may be your church home. But are you merely associated with it, or are you actively a part of it? When believers live in community and take the calling very seriously, God works in amazing ways. Imagine for a moment what he can and will do in and through us as we live this concept to its fullest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this challenge from your word that even as I'm preaching is convicting my own heart. Um, of greater ways I need to be involved in, 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 um, in carrying out community. May we see the importance of one another and may we purposefully contribute. Um, I can't even begin to imagine, uh, well, I, I can in some respects by testimonies I've heard as it, 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 this concept has lived out, how beautiful that looks. And how not only there are our people's needs being met and, and, and people reached within the church, but, but how communities around them are, are, are reached with the gospel as well. And how it impacts the towns that the, that church, local church calls home. So find us faithful to this. Um, convict us as we're straying from your example and what you have modeled. Um, help us to think through... Um, in our own relationships, how to practically live out these communal concepts. Thank you uh, for um, your relationship with us and the fact that you desire that and even as we are separated by sin, that you provided the way of restoration. We praise you and we thank you for that. Uh, may we live to honor and glorify your name. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Bye.
We're going to take a moment now to observe communion together. Uh, another one of those concepts that really, or it, it really ties into what we've been talking about this morning, all about with community. Uh, if you need to pause for a moment, please do um, find a, a cracker or uh, some juice that you can uh, participate with us in this. As we here at Grace observe communion together, we always like to remind people that. Um, this is not a time of salvation itself. It's meant to reflect back upon salvation. Uh, we know that in some places and churches that uh, it is preached and taught that is, as one uh, takes the elements in, uh, drinks the juice, takes, eats the, 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 the bread, that those things bring grace and forgiveness to their lives. And, and, and these don't. Um, as the Apostle Paul clearly explains in 1 Corinthians 11, these are meant to be symbols uh, reminding us what God has done. In fact, several times he uses that word in remembrance. Um, it, it's meant to reflect back on the great work that Christ has done on our behalf. Um, and so that we always want to start with that. Salvation is ultimately by, faith, or by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. It's not of works, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, because then that would give us a reason to boast and a reason then that we could claim that we are our own self-saviors. And it steals then some of the glory 
from God and we are glorified in that. But God is the one who gets the glory. And as we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I always like to come back to this passage and read from it as we observe communion together. Paul in chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I received from you what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, in the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We know that according to the Old Testament law, of course, that that God instituted sacrifice as the means to... um, for forgiveness of sins. Uh, Ultimately, it was looking forward to Jesus himself who would give himself, his body, for us that we might have salvation as we we profess faith in him for that. Um, In relation, though, to this idea of community and um, in communion that we're talking about right now, I was thinking about the, the bread and Jesus giving himself for us and I'm always continually impacted by the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, verse 4. It says, For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. And he did this by predestining us to adoption as his legal heirs through Jesus Christ according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, the glory of his grace that he freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved son. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. I won't go much further because that's going to steal Paul's thunder as he talks about the cup in a moment. But I'm always impacted by the reality that as God created the universe, there could have been no sin at all. Uh, but as he gave man the capacity to choose, he understood that we would ultimately that Adam and Eve would choose to, um, to disobey. And in that plan for our world, again, before the foundation of the world was set, was already this plan of salvation, that Christ would give himself for us. Um, and that leaves me with immense wonder and amazement uh, at God. Uh, we know that it ultimately gives him the glory because it's all about him. He is the central focal point of all of this. Um, I think it was Lewis Perry Schaefer who said that God is working out um, essentially a plan that is for the, 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 that is the best and for ultimately his glory and that we'll ultimately understand that one day uh, as we get to heaven. But um, again, just struck with that fact and that reality as we come to communion that, that God is, is we turn from him even before the foundation of the world still sought relationship with us and um, we have here given his body for us uh, so let's take a moment and thank the lord for this the bread and for the what it represents and reminds us about let's pray father we are so grateful that as we think about uh, these scriptures in eternity past that you had a plan set in mo- or a plan designed um, before sin itself even entered the world. Uh, you knew that Christ would come. You knew that, that he would give himself for us. And Father, we are left with immense gratitude and thanksgiving and praise to you. Um, because as we've been talking about community this morning, you sought us. Uh, as those relationships, again, were broken, you knew what it would take to restore it. Um, And you did it. And we are so, so thankful for that. Um, May our gratitude and love for you because of that be expressed in our obedience, we pray. Um, Give us the strength to do that and help us to appreciate your grace all the more each and every day as we come to understand it. We pray this in your name. Amen. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Since we're in the month of September now, I looked at the calendar and it, we see uh, three Jewish holidays in this month. Rosh Hashanah is the civil beginning of the civil New Year, so it's like a New Year's for them. 
And then we look at um, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, and that certainly has significance for us as well as believers uh, moving into the New Testament time and what that means and the fulfillment. And then the Feast of Tabernacles or Sokhot. And those three feasts are in this month. But it's interesting that um, in the Mishnah, which was just simply a Jewish holy book, it's not the Bible, but, uh, mentioned that Rosh Hashanah, um, the day of judgment, it's because that they believe that God opens the book of life and decides who will live and who will die in the coming year. And to stave off death, 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and the Day of Atonement, um, or Yom Kippur, provides the opportunity for Jewish people to repent to assure a good and full year ahead. Now, obviously that is not biblical. Uh, God is not uh, setting aside these 10 days to decide who lives and dies, and this is not just a one time a year that people should repent and come in a right relationship with Him. But it is interesting. And I also read in an, in an article in uh, Israel My Glory from uh, Friends of Israel in earlier times, and they weren't specific about how early, but I think it's going back a long way. It said that the leaders of the Jewish communities fasted on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, believing that their act would pardon one-third of Israel's sins. And then between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, another group of selected people also fasted, earning the pardon of another third of Israel's sins. And then finally, on the Day of Atonement, everybody fasted, wiping, them out, wiping out the remainder, remaining third of Israel's sins. Now, we have to take a, a, a quick look. Fasting does not wipe out anybody's sins. It never did. In fact, Revelation 1.5 says, All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sin by shedding his blood for us. It is the finished work of Christ alone that takes care of the penalty for our sins. And um, uh, today, fasting is not uh, common in, on Rosh Hashanah. In fed, uh, instead, uh, meals are eaten and they... They go in a whole different direction. So that, that was an old style. But it, the fact that it was there at all, and people thought that they could do something uh, religious to get away from their sins uh, is something that we need to remember today that that is not the case. Um, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 24, they will never be condemned for their sins for they've already been passed from death to life. And that was because Jesus died for them. And he said, believe in me, you'll have everlasting life. And you pass from death to life. That's a, that is a, an immediate transition from one thing to the other. And that's what we're remembering as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're remembering that Jesus died for us and shed his blood for us. And that's why we, we have the cup. And as Paul said, this is the new covenant, or Jesus said at the, at the Passover, and again, relating to the Jewish feast. This is the new covenant in my blood. And that goes back into the Old Testament where he said, I will forgive your sins. I will give you the Holy Spirit. I'll change your heart from stone to life. And we have all those things in that new covenant that we enjoy today. And that's what we are reminded by uh, with the cup. So let's pray and thank God for the cup before us. Our Father, thank you so much for the cup that we hold, that cup of redemption that reminds us that it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin and nothing else. We thank you that he paid the penalty for our sin and that we could have life, that we pass from death into life when we believe in him. So we're grateful for this communion now with him and with our brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. As we close out this morning, we just want to leave you with these words from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who brought by the blood of the eternal covenant, excuse me, who the, may the God of peace who by the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus, equip you with every good thing to do his will, 
working in us what is pleasing before him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Be sure to uh, check in with us this coming Sunday as we start up Romans again. Until then, God bless. Mm -hmm.